Hi, good evening. My name's Elaine Jones and I manage the Confucius Institute here at the University. There are 29, at the last count, Confucius Institutes in the UK and there's more than 500 worldwide. And each one of them has a different purpose. Uh, our main purpose, CI at Edge Hill, is the teaching of Chinese language. And we do that through free language courses to all our students, to our staff, to the local community, to local businesses. We work a lot with, in partnership with schools, delivering in primary schools and high schools. I think we work with over 23, 24 schools this year. And we also do teacher training programmes. We don't just focus on language, we also want to promote um, a broader and deeper understanding of Chinese culture and contemporary China. And we do that through events such as tonight. So we have public events where we try and encourage better understanding of Chinese culture. Um, tonight's event is a collaboration between the Confucius Institute and the Institute for Creative Enterprise. And they're the two bodies who bring this to you tonight. Um, I'm delighted to be here and delighted with the turnout and to share the evening with you. And I'm delighted and I have great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our special guest, David Yip, from Confucius Institute here and the Edge Hill University. Thank you. Um, I will hand over to Professor Roger Shannon, who is the director of ICE, the Institute for um, almost lost the title, creative, <laughs> creative Enterprise, who will give a full introduction to our special guest, David Yip. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Well, just to, to add to what Elaine was saying, um, ICE is one of the university's research institutes. Uh, there are three. Um, PGMI, which is involved with... Um, the medical practices and I4P which is about social policy but with ICE we're involved with the creative industries, the creative economy, um, the general arts and cultural sector of the university and also the city and the region and we regularly run events um, in Creative Edge where our media department is housed with individuals and organisations that we feel have uh, a significant uh, commentary to make about their own professional life or about the issues that are pinging around the world of culture and uh, creativity. And I'm really delighted that um, we've been able to uh, welcome David Yip to the university this evening because David um, has had a number of decades, I won't say how many, and he <laughs> won't say how many either, yet, um, a number of decades uh, contribution to the UK's screen culture in both uh, film and television, but he's also uh, an acknowledged um, thespian, as director for the stage, has appeared on the stage, he's also done quite a number of radio um, documentaries. But he's been in a fantastic uh, array of, of movies, television programmes. Um, I could reel off some now, but I would encourage you to, to go and seek uh, his work uh, through IMDb or online later on, because then you'll see that, that he's been in over 30 movies. Uh, he's been in uh, most of the um, primetime uh, drama series on either BBC or Channel 4 or ITV over the years. That includes going back to Quatermass, Doctor Who, Holby, Casualty. Uh, he had a great stint in Brookside. And uh, I've got some personal connections because we, we first met when uh, I was making, uh, I was involved in the film festival in Birmingham and David was the lead actor in uh, one of the first Anglo-Chinese movies called Ping Pong. And David came to the festival and um, almost um, captivated um, the festival audience with his generosity, geniality, and I think you almost moved to Birmingham for the week <laughs> at the time. 
And later on, we worked on uh, other films. He, he had a cameo in a feature film I produced called Out of Order. And then we worked on a film called Blue Funnel, some of which we may s see later on. So his, um, his contribution to UK film and t TV uh, culture is, is, uh, is widely acknowledged and um, is also from Liverpool. So he represents the city and also the longest um, or the longest lasting um, Chinese community in the UK. So in there's Europe. in Europe. Uh, some uh, and some of these things we, we will sort of tease out and um, touch on. So just to get the ball rolling, um, I know that you um, started your acting work really or your uh, acting training at E15 in London mm. and um, I think you finished there in the early 70s but were you involved in uh, drama groups or um, youth theatre groups in Liverpool in, in the late 60s early 70s? Yeah I left I left uh, let me just work backwards uh, I just went to drama school in 71 yeah I've only ever had in uh, I'm I've been four, I'm 44 years a professional actor. Uh, I went to drama school for two years, and for only two years I've ever had a proper job. And that's when I first left uh, school. I, was, I worked for British Railways as a, as a shipping clerk in uh, Edge Hill, funny enough, actually. Edge Hill, yeah. I just didn't <laughs> so realise the connection. To be yeah. here. And, and, and I was a clerk. And, and it's interesting, because uh, at that time I was... Uh, I, w I never had an idea about being an actor. A kid like me, from Liverpool, from Chinese family, I, you didn't see anyone on... You had no role models to talk about being an actor. But I started, once I left school, I took myself to the theatre. And Liverpool has had five working theatres at that time. And the first production I ever paid for myself was uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona at the Liverpool Playhouse. Uh, I was up in the gods, and it was a modern dress production. And so they had scooters on... Mm. Uh, scooters and they were all and a black guy who I got to know later called Tom Baptiste he played the Duke and I, I watched this thing thinking that's amazing you know scooters and everything else not ever thinking I could be on the stage but just thinking isn't this thing called theatre weird and, <laughs> and lovely and to so what year would that have been this would this was this was uh, so uh, sorry 66 six, about 67 68 mm -hmm. uh, and Quite honest, being a shipping, being a clerk, was, you, I could do the work in about half an hour that I had to do in the day. But my job, I was able to, I, I could go for walks around the, the big uh, areas where all the, all the trains were. I could just, so I started disappearing off into town and I started going to the library. And that's when I discovered just reading drama in a way. So, so would that be the classics, Shakespeare, no, no, or no, modern actually, drama? No, actually, you know, it's interesting, you know the William Brown Street Library? I wa I've said this story many times. I walked in and turned right. It just happened to be the drama department. Well, God knows what it would, it would be anything else. But it happened to be the drama department. I am, and the first play I picked up was Waiting for Godot um, by, by Samuel Beckett. And I, and I took this play back and I, thought, and I read it and I thought, bloody hell, <laughs> what is this? What was this about? How, how did you do this? But it just intrigued me because it was like nothing I'd ever deceived. And that's what made me get, start going to theatre. So I started asking, I started going around the Liverpool theatres asking for a job, not knowing at all what a job would be. I mean, I don't know what you would do. So those would be the, 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 the every man, the every man, the, 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 the Royal Court, every man, yeah, you, you, the, and, and, the, and uh, uh, Neptune. And cut a long story short, a lovely lady called Teresa Collard, who I'm still in touch with, uh, gave me my first job uh, as a, an assistant stage manager, which meant you basically you made the tea and brushed the, brushed the floor. And I did that, and did that for a year. And, and during that mm -hmm. time, I was doing youth theatre. And Barry Kyle, who, who was a very famous RSC director, he, he, he cut his teeth being in charge of the youth theatre at the Playhouse. Yeah, I mean, uh, okay. um, and everyone thought he was amazing because he had long hair. He came from London. He got, had one of those sh sheepskin coat things, you know. Um, and uh, it was then I went to the Everyman mm -hmm. Theatre a year later. Uh, when you work in the theatre, you start to get to know people. So I got to know the people at the Everyman. And as you do, and you have a drink with them. And, and, and that would have been, the, I suppose, slightly before the Ian Hart, David Morrissey uh, Alison Stedman, people like yeah. that around there. Uh, Jonathan Price, mm -hmm. people like that. And actually, Liverpool, well, apart from this music, the, the theatre in Liverpool was a centre of European theatre. Mm -hmm. The new writing, the acting, 
It was amazing. It was. That would have been what also the time of Willie Russell's Breeze Block Park, but John Paul George, and no, no, no just before that because I saw John Paul George when I was in London at drama school. Uh, but basically, at, at the Everyman, you're working with professional actors, thingy thingy. And at that time, I still remember an actor called Gavin Richards said to me one day, "Yeah, you're going to join the union." And I said, "Yeah, what do I have to do?" And he said, "You know, sign this, give me your money." Mm -hmm. And I don't, you, I don't know if you remember, but in those days, yeah. Yeah, I, I became a member of Equity one week before it became a closed shop. Uh, so I had my Equity card. And then I went to drama school. Uh, and E15, so if you don't know, E15 is a postal district in London. It's where the, Olympic, where the Olympics were held in London, uh, Stratford. Uh, and it's called, uh, an e, in, at E15, Joan Littlewood, who changed the face of British theatre in the 50s, and, and still the, the, the rever reverberations of what she did to the theatre are still, well, in certainly my generation mm -hmm. and on. And the, the, the drama school I went to was, was, was named after the uh, London area where she went. And um, one of the great things about that was that I, I applied for E15 audition, not knowing actually what a drama school was. The guy said to me, you should go to drama school. And he, well, what do you do? I had to take a day off work and go to London, no pay, and I spent a day at E15, and it was fantastic. It was just, it was like being at school again. You could, you could play games. C can you remember what you uh, had prepared as your audition oh, yeah, piece? Well, it is, you had to prepare a Shakespeare piece and a modern, I can't remember the actual pieces, but because I, I got to know the actors of the Everyman, I stayed with two of them uh, in their flat in London, and, this, and one actress said to me, do you want to go through your pieces? And I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> and I went through my pieces, and I could see from her face, she was thinking, <laughs> Don't. I think try that. She said, have you got anything else? I said, oh yeah, well I've, I've written this sort of, I've written a little piece. Um, and, and, and she said, well do that. And then she said, do that. She said, do that tomorrow. And in fact, that's how I got into drama school. Because my, my Shakespeare piece and my other piece were crap. They absolutely, <laughs> well they wouldn't have got me through the door. But actually E15 was like this idea of creating, improvising. Because yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, and I have no, I, know I, it was a, I was very raw. So, but, um, did you um, find at the time that moving from E15 to work in, you know, as a, as a jobbing actor was a, a, an easy process or was it, was it more extended and, you know, you took, no. it took several years to get off the ground? Well, two things. It, the training at E15 was very, uh, it was very intense, but also it didn't, it, it didn't try to teach you to, um, and it was basically in those days you, you were trained for the theatre. You weren't trained for radio or television or film. Theatre was the thing you were trained for. Uh, e15, the way E15 worked, it, it was very practical and very down to earth. Whereas Rada basically trained you to be a star, well, you know, in a way. And again, this, this equity card is very valuable because when it came to the end of our training, they gave you this talk about, because by then equity was a closed shop, they said, oh, okay, so you've got to, to get an equity card, you have to have a contract, you've got to be able to work, and blah, blah, blah. blah. And everyone's talking about equity cards, blah, blah, blah. And, I, and all my belongings were in a tea chest. So I went back to my digs. I'm going, I was digging around and thinking, equity card, equity card. And I, I find this red little provisional <laughs> equity card. I took it in the next day and said, is this what you're talking about? And they go, oh, my God, it's an equity card. Because I tell you, I had actresses and people who trained with me who spent six months riding elephants in India, in, in, in Italy, trying to get an equity card. It was very difficult in those days. No, so basically, mm -hmm. I had an equity card. I, I, got, two, I got two jobs straight away. I, I never, basically, I didn't start working mm -hmm. for 10 years. So well. actually, it wasn't. But what it was, and I say this to drama students now, or I see this people interested in the th you go, you don't go to drama school, you don't come out of a drama school as an actor. What you do is you come out with a, 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 a bag of the tools. tools. And over the years, those you, you suddenly go, oh yeah, oh, oh I see, okay. Yeah. And even now, even now, and that's what I like about acting, even now you go, oh, oh yeah, okay, okay. So okay. Um, did you, when you were at E15 and maybe before in the Liverpool theatres, did you come across um, more or any uh, non-white actors? That uh, was the diversity no, or the no, lack of no, diversity no, there? No, 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 absolutely not. No, I was the only. No, no, I think I'm right. I was the only non-white. I think I was the only. I was a non-white uh, student there in in the three in, of all the years. Uh, I mean, we had a lot, quite a few Americans mm. who I think had Polish extraction. It's various things, but yeah. Uh, 
And also, I've got to say this, when I, when I went to E15, I had a very strong Liverpool accent. Uh, and when the first week you're there, you, you, they give you extracts and plays and you have to work on it and then you perform them. And you, then the, the voice people and everything else, they, they look at you and they give you... I, they, they were sitting there, they said to me, look, um, great. I said, you, I said, you've got a very strong Liverpool accent and you, and you, and you look Chinese. That's going to limit you <laughs> an awful <laughs> lot for parts. And, but they, did, they didn't say to me, lose it. They just said, look, you know, because uh, E15, you're, 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 following, you're following the trainings of Stanislavski, which in essence is about mm. becoming a blank sheet of paper so you, could, you can put on the, char the things of a, your character. And I, and I, I went with them because I thought, and we had very good voice teachers who didn't, they didn't say to me, you've got to lose your accent. They just said, look, you've got... If you really want to be versatile, you've got to have the ability not to have the accent. Do you see what I mean? And I'll be honest now, I mean, the way I speak, I know I don't sound necessarily scouts, but when I have a drink with my brother later, I have a few of those, you, <laughs> you slip into it. But to be honest, to be really truthfully honest, if I was to, be, to play a, a scouser tomorrow or to next week, I would really go have to work, work on it. I can mm -hmm. do a standard, you know, jokey one. But the subtleties now, I, 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 would, I would treat it as, a, as an accent. But that's good. So they said to me, yeah. and, 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 it, and it, it, it's true, I actually, and I, I also, because just before I left drama school, and I worked very hard at drama school, and when you leave drama school, you're going to, you want to play Hamlet, you know? Because I say, we're trained in theatre, we weren't trained in anything else, theatre. So I thought, I'm going to play Hamlet, I'm going to play Hamlet. And one of the last things one of my tutors said to me was, oh, don't worry, you'll be fine, because, you know, you can do lots of things in film, meaning you can play Chinese guys in, in takeaways or thing in film. And I thought, I thought, well, oh, sod you. I've just bloody trained all this time. I'm going to play, I'm going to play Hamlet. Now, I've never played Hamlet, but I have, I've done a lot of Shakespeare. But I made a conscious decision that I was only going to do theatre for the first seven years. I didn't, I didn't mention seven years, but I thought, I, I've, I've got to do, I want to do theatre, because that's what my tools mm -hmm. were for. Uh, and I was lucky, because I went to the Young Vic for, for a year and a half, and I've done a lot, did a lot of Shakespeare. And of course, the very soon, as soon as I go into television, I mean, the first television I did was Savages, and I played a South American Indian. And my one line was, Nobby Stye, Nobby Stye. <laughs> and, then, and, and it was very stereotypical then. I, I, and, and I soon realized, actually, I soon realized uh, that at, at the time, there was more, opportuni there was more opportunity in theater, because th th in those days, every city had its own repertory company. And we had two. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but now it's more, it's more difficult. And over the years, I've, been, I've always been conscious of the fact that I, I made a few mistakes early in my career playing real stereotypical idiots, uh, Chinese parts. And I thought, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I really don't want to mm. do that. I, I, I want to say something, you know? So your, um, your first, I suppose, major television break was Chinese, Chinese mm. Detective, which at the time... Of, uh, obviously, was so groundbreaking um, because it it um, it used um, a police series like the Sweeney and Zed cars in in terms of the storylines, but it put uh, the lead actor in the role of a young Chinese exactly. actor it yourself. Um, that that was a series which in Kennedy Martin wrote, mm. Mm. and uh, at the time, I think for many young Chinese in the country. Um, seeing a Chinese actor in carrying the lead role, uh, and I don't think it's it's happened since. No, well, actually, it wasn't so it's Chinese because even as when I was a kid, you know, it was a it was a huge thing if you saw a non-white face, apart from you know doc geographical documentaries. But you saw a white face, a non-white face on a television doing something. You you rush in and go and say, look, 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 look. But I've had so many people from other minorities say to me over the years, when you appeared on the screen, we went bananas. Yes. Well, let's have a look at, this is, firstly, we've got a series of clips of, but the first is the opening title sequence for The Chinese Detective. You notice not a sexy, fast car. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was the tone. It is, he's an East End, he's, he's an East End British-born boy whose dad's Chinese, his parents were Chinese. And one of the most groundbreaking thing about it was that uh, always before that, there, there was more, everything had to be very stereotypical. Now, my dad, the dad in, in his dad in the series uh, was a Chinese guy and he had a bit of an accent, but, but basically he worked on the docks. 
And it, 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 they managed to balance through the two series the idea of, of the son working his way through the police. And there's a, a sub-story how mm. he's, he's in the police because his dad was, was, was uh, uh, wrongly, wrongly imprisoned for some, uh, through corruption of police. And then he finally solves that. But a r running parallel to the fact that his dad was a traditionalist and you know, really wanted him to, to settle down. And actually, th I, do have a s I had a sister in the series too. And at one point she said to me, um, this is, I think this is one of why Charlie's Day didn't last too long, only two series, because at once she says, now you're a policeman, I suppose you vote conservative. <laughs> and he turns around and says, well, actually, I've hit some lows, but not that low. <laughs> 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 and Thatcher had just come into power. So. <laughs> Did, um, but with, with that series, was it the case that the writers had come up with the idea of the Chinese detective and then they found an actor and they may have interviewed or, or, or did they find you and build something no. around you? Ian Kennedy Martin, uh, sorry, for most of you young people would know, but he wrote made about five major television series. And he, he said to, he, said, he told me later, he said, he's, from, he, he's from the Gorbals in, 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 uh, in, in Glasgow. So from really tough working class area. And he wrote, he'd written all these, all these detective series and he thought, now should I? He thought, and people were trying to get him to write one with a black detective in it. And he said, the trouble is, I have a black guy, it's got to be about racism, blah, blah, blah. And then he suddenly, he said, I suddenly thought, because we've got Chinese people in, mm. you know, in London. Well, what happens if he's Chinese? Or he, he called it. And he'd only written, he'd written a bit, uh, a first episode. And then I got cast quite early on. And we, and we, we had this fantastic relationship. We started to talk. Uh, and I told him about my background, mm -hmm. and he told me about his. And he was incredibly su successful by then, very wealthy. But he'd come from this very poor working class background. And not, and not only that, his brother was also an equally famous uh, uh, Troy screenwriter. Kennedy Martin. Troy Kennedy Martin. Uh, and what I loved about it, Ian wrote every episode bar one. And what I loved about him was that he he he, he wanted he stayed true to, he stayed true to the to the character of John Ho, but he also wove the stories in and it was very it was very what, what you see also on there is the old east end of london is it's now mm. all these amazing mm. things but, but and it was very run down and it, 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 it's about it, it was it's about people climbing out of where they came from mm. and trying to better themselves and i i love the opening music on that i mean it's <laughs> it's and also so, it's such good funk yeah. music at the beginning but the also the other important thing he said to me because i said oh do i have to learn you know Kung Fu and all that. I don't <laughs> he said, no, no. He said, that, and, and, that, and the producer said to me, because the one thing that's going to happen is when, when, when people first watch this program, they're going to wait for the moment that, you know, six guys get him in a corner and he's going to go like Bruce Lee. He's going to, you know, <laughs> kick their, all their heads off and beat them all. He said, no, no, John Ho doesn't do that. Yeah. John Ho sees six guys, he runs around, he runs away, <laughs> runs around the corner, and, get, and then if they run around the corner, he hits him on the head with a brick or something. Yeah. And, 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 and it's true. That's, and, and people were waiting, waiting, thinking, is this guy mm. going to do that? I mean, he did confront... And he, never, he yeah. never did. He, could, he never could, but he, mm. it, it, it was a good way to do it. And in the BBC, at that, at that time, uh, what's that series called in America? Um, Charlie Chan. Charlie Chan? Charlie, Charlie Chan yeah. was shown regularly on British television. Charlie Chan is a television series in America about uh, a, a detective who's... And he has all these sons called Number One Son, Number Two Son, literally. And actually, the guy who played Charlie Chan wasn't, it wasn't actually Chinese. wasn't East Asian. He was, he was a white guy. And he was very good, but he was a white guy. And I remember when Charlie Chan was on here, I go to school the next day, and the kids are going, ah, oh, like, uh, I think, what are you doing, what are you doing? Because you know, they would just take the piss out of you. No, one of the things I remember about that series was whenever he was asked where he was from, because pe the, the other person yeah. would be suggesting that they weren't British, he would always say, I'm a Cockney. Mm. Which mm. kind of mm. Um, mm. upended mm. The, the stereotypes that were there. Mm. And I think, um, as a series, it, it really broke a lot of ground. And we're going to see a short clip from one of the, the episodes of The Chinese All Detective right. when um, John Ho um, is up against an East End villain played by Ian Hendry. The great Ian Hendry. And again, the music is pretty good. Do, do you recall your um, experiences of making those? Oh, yeah, because I told you, I, I was 98, I'd only been out of drama school uh, seven years, and I'd done all theatre, apart from maybe, uh, tiny bits of television. So that was my university. And, and when I look, you know, I had to learn 
how to act in front of the camera all the time, because I was the main character. I, I worked with fantastic British actors all the time. Uh, and I, yeah, there's, there's a lot of bullshitting going on there, but I learned, it was a fantastic learning thing. And of course, every one of those is a film. We shot, it's all on film, so we shot every episode like, as a film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's a fantastic learning curve. Uh, I've looked at them since. You go back and go, oh yeah, of course. There's, you know, you'd love to do them all again. But it, it was yes, it taught me. It taught me an incredible lot. Um, and appreciating, listening, and watching the other, the, the really experienced actors mm -hmm. work with a camera. And then yeah. I mean, in many ways, um, it, regarding your TV career, you're you're fondly remembered for the character of John Ho, and. Um, your work in the Chinese detective did um, I mean I know it ran for two years but were there opportunities to continue it no. or did you decide no, well not I not to stay no, with no, it? No, 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 it wasn't. Even, wasn't it? I, I, I was serious when I said about the joke about the conservatives because it was very. You know, it was all very. It was really. It was. When I say it's depressing, it it, it it had no glamour to it at all. It was very dour, and and he lived in this crappy place and. You know, I mean, I think in the second series, I st he started to wear a suit a bit more. But basically, the BBC were going, you know, and, what was, and the Conservatives didn't like what was being said. And, and basically, then they had the chance to do John Nettles in the Isle of Wight, was it? Which is much more glamorous. Uh, um. I forget what it's called now. But he, he was great, don't get me wrong. Bergerac. So, Bergerac. Bergerac. Bergerac was much, much sexier, and it looked great. It was in, and quite honestly, they didn't want to spend their money there. But we did 14 episodes, and... Uh, but uh, yeah. And did you then um, continue with TV before you then got bigger oh, breaks well, into the movie business? Chinese Detective opened so many doors for me uh, uh, because there I was. I mean, for a while I was, you know, in, 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 I, I was in public eye, and that was, yeah, it was great. That's why I met Steven Spielberg, and I, I was able to do uh, an Indiana Jones mm -hmm. film um, because of the Indiana Jones film. I was able to do a Bond film. Uh, it was very strange, actually, because uh, f f uh, being, I suppose, I, I suppose I kissed the skirts of, fa of, of fame in a way, and uh, it was great for a while, but I was so glad when it, when it went away, <laughs> actually. But do, do you think that the, um, the, the opportunity that, that opened up through The Chinese Detective um, allowed you to move somewhat seamlessly into, into film? Beca uh, because of the... the the higher profile it gave well, you. Given the opportunity, but for example, because BBC, Chuck Dyson was on BBC, my agent kept putting me up for stuff on ITV and things like that, and they go, oh, but no, but the trouble is he's the Chinese detective. And whereas all these guys who were in, in <laughs> things in ITV were constantly on BBC, I think, and no, there, was a there still was a difficulty, because it, Ch J John Ho as a character was so unique, mm -hmm. and no one else was offering that opportunity. So you, do you think that they were expecting you to only sort of deliver that type of character? No, but they didn't have those characters. Literally they still wanted you to play the, the silly the silly guy or, or the gangster or the, you know, the takeaway owner, whatever. But films, I mean, usually international films were much better. Because they would, they would give you a, a wider palette of, of, yeah. of acting yeah. styles or, a, yeah. or yeah, characters right. to get well, your teeth more into. They, they, and also then Ping Pong, you know, the, the first British real film about the Chinese Yeah, that was around. 86, I yeah. think. Um, that was um, Po Chi Leung. Po Chi Leung, yeah. yeah. Um, you, you were the lead role in that. Yep. Yeah. And that was a British movie. And Sour Sweet came out around the same, Tim yeah. an adaptation of Timothy Moe's But they brought novel. all Hong Kong actors in, mainly to do that. Um, mm. So yeah. did, did you get a sense at that time in, in the 80s then that there was um, more opportunities opening up for a greater diverse casting? No. No. It was, it was no, still it very was difficult. Th and that was the frustrating part, in a sense, because, I mean, if, if, a, if, a, if I'd been white actor, maybe, you might have gone on to many other things. But, I, but no, because the, the trouble was, it, the Chinese detective was so ahead of everybody else, there was nothing there to take up the slack. Right. People were going, oh, well, well you know, we haven't, we haven't got there yet. Uh, now, I, you know, it's... I think you said it before, I made that in 1980. I'm still the only East Asian actor, British East Asian actor, who's in this country who's ever led a television program. They're getting better. I mean, it's, I mean you've seen good mm -hmm. actors in many things, but they've, they've never led them. And isn't that a shame in 2017? Yeah. 
you know, that, that's that happened. That's why I wanted to play the opening credit sequence first because it's got David Jip as the Chinese mm. detective and you're the, um, the, the actor that delivers that series. But it, um, move, it, move on to um, the, the work that you, you did in movies with Spielberg and John Emil and, um, and with the Bond movie. Mm. Um, how did those opportunities arise for you? Well, one day my agent said, you know, you, Steven you have, Spielberg's you on you the have phone. this fantasy, yeah, Steven Spielberg's on the phone. And my agent said to me, uh, Steven Spielberg wants to meet you. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I went to, I went to a, a, an office in, in central London and, uh, and was that shown into a room and there was Steven Spielberg. And he, he was amazing. He was one of the nicest people that I've ever met. Um, and was he aware of the Chinese detective, or uh, just? Or well, just at that first interview, I, I, he wa I, don't, I don't know if he was or wasn't, but he was just very. Because most, you know, it, it was very. He, he just talked to me. He didn't do. He didn't do a script or anything. He just talked to me, told me what roughly the idea, this idea, and he said, you know, are you inter Would you be interested? And I said yes. And then when we started working together, it just so happened, we were we were, we were filming in Pinewood. And it just so happened that the Chinese detective was, was repeating on mm -hmm. British television. Mm -hmm. And both he and Harrison Ford said to me, hey, we've seen your, <laughs> we've seen your thing and it's really, we like it. And I said, why don't you make a movie of it? <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't, he didn't, he didn't. So. Um, and I've got to say, they, yeah. uh, because they were young, the, young, the young George, uh, Harrison Ford, the young Steven Spielberg, the young George Lucas, they were amazing. They, they worked incredibly hard. Uh, and, and, but they also, they, well, they were great fun. And, and it typifies the sense that uh, these sets were, were meant to be secure sets, right? And so they're, they're very conscious. And then, but people kept saying, oh, can we, can we bring our kids in? Our kids are desperate to meet you. And so one day, it was a Thursday afternoon, they said, okay, um, three o'clock Thursday afternoon, you can bring your kids in for, or friends and kids in for an hour. And I said, what they did, it, it was amazing. They, this whole movie stopped. Everyone was there, George, uh, every, Harris, the lots, George, look, they all sit there. They let the families mm -hmm. in, they crawled all over the cameras, they were allowed to touch, do <laughs> that and that, and later, an hour, go. So do, do, you, do you think with, with the, the film world that you came into contact with, that there was more um, tolerance, more uh, appreciation of, of having a wider group of They're of Americans. Actors. They were yeah. Americans. They were Americans. They, were, they, had, they had a slightly different mindset, broader mindset than we had in this country. Uh, that's as true of the Bond films mm -hmm. too. Same with the Bond films. But you had to have, so long as you had, you had to have some sort of reputation. You had to be good they, at your job they, as well, obviously. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. They, they, but they also, they didn't, at that point, they weren't picking people off the street. Except the little kid in, in the film I made was uh, obviously uh, the, the, the child that was a Vietnamese refugee. Thing. But no, they were, but they, they appreciated you for your, for your art. Now, I've got to say, my head, because I, I was so trained into theatre, I mean, I. Maybe if you did it now, you, 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 didn't have, you didn't have all the social networks and... Mm -hmm. that, that. I, I just took it, I oh, went, oh yeah, fine, it's, I've done that, I've done that. I wasn't desperately ambitious to go to Hollywood or do anything like that. It wasn't something you necessarily did, but um, I enjoyed it while mm. it was there. But I must admit, I still, and it's always been my way, I like, I like theatre in a sense, because mm. as an actor, I have some control. You know, you don't... Uh, in a film, mm. you, you know, you, you give it everything. You give it, it, and it goes anyway. into a cutting room, and it can be cut all ways. The same, the same in television. Uh, but well, at least if you rehearse a play, and when on the, every time mm. you perform it, you can do you do what you do. And you but you but are, you, are, are you an actor that would prefer film rather than TV, or do you no, look no, upon no, them on the spectrum no, of that no. very much? But if, but if someone said to me, you can only do one thing, mm. you would do it theater. Would have to be theater because, yeah. But I'd be you know poor, depending on where you do, but poorer for it. But it, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like. It. I mean, even talk. You know, this is theatre in a way, and you're you're sitting there, <laughs> and I'm sitting here. But you know, it's it's wonderful when you when you're perf when you're doing a, a play, and if, even if you came every night, the same people sit in the same places. It's always mm. going to be different. But when you started to do the bigger movies, um, the with Scorsese and the Bond movie, no, I didn't want with Scorsese. But, but oh, so, oh <laughs> no, sorry, not Scorsese. Spielberg. Sorry, he, he lost my number. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what was your reaction to the different um, styles ah, of acting that you had to do? Or it was, or, or it was terrifying, it was terrifying, but equally, you looked around you, you know, and I was, um, I was lucky, because I always tended to work with, with the stars, th th those particular scenes, happened to be with the, and you just basically watch them. But again, the thing is, 
in a theatre situation, you get to know each other because you do rehearsal. Mm. So I can say, hi, Roger, how are you doing? Uh, in movies, there's, it's very clearly demarcated. And so your megastar, although Harrison Ford was incredibly a uh, nice guy, but basically y you waited for him to come on the set and then and then he, you know, he, he didn't get introduce you, whatever. And the one, one thing you don't say to a, a star is, uh, I'm sorry, you got that line wrong. Could you give it to me again? <laughs> <laughs> I, I realized with Roger Moore when he did the Bond film, he was, a, he was very sweet, but he was in his own world. And when we ran the lines, uh, the first time we ran them, they bore no relation to the script I'd been learning. <laughs> <laughs> so I, like, you don't say anything. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll wait for him to stop speaking, <laughs> and, then I'll, and then I'll talk. <laughs> and that's what you had to do. That's what you had to do. Um, well, fortunately for you, we've chosen the clip from the Indiana Jones movie, not the Bond. Not the oh, right. <laughs> so it's the Indiana Jones film, Temple of Doom. All right, yes. Um, and this is a Spielberg-directed film, and um, you play... Wuhan. Wuhan. And this is a, one of the clips from one we could find. I died in my first three films. Died. <laughs> I've just apologised today for showing the clip when he died in the movie. <laughs> it's all right, I don't mind. <laughs> you, you did it very well. <laughs> it's interesting, actually, because when I did the Bond film, I, I, I had to go to America to shoot most of it, the outside, and I had to play, I was playing a, 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 a CIA man, and I had to play an American, so I, went, I was in America playing a CIA, an American, that was a bit scary, because in, in those days again, we didn't have the internet, so you, you went to a voice coach, you're doing the American accent, and of course you go out, and you're with real Americans, and I just, um, sorry, and, and the fact is, you, you, you worry and worry about, you know, is it going to be right, isn't it not going to be right? And actually, when you're there, it's amazing how people, you just, you, just, you sort of morph into it in a way. Do, do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So but but with, with your experience of a number of large scale studio films, mm. like the, like we've just seen Indiana Jones and A View to a Kill, Entrapment by John Emile, mm. um, did, um, did you find that, the Opportunities were opening up in British movies at the time for you, or no. or did you find that you had to, in a sense, uh, continue the TV side? It was very bitty. I mean, and I'm not. I mean, I had, I was working in various things, but it was very bitty. There was there was no progression, and I, you know, it's like, it's like uh, I've worked for the RSC about five times. But we've only done one Shakespeare play with them. Do you just do you see what mm. I mean? Is you can't. So it's always that bitty, and the same with that. Because, and again, as an, as, as an, as an actor doing uh, a, a cameo party in a big movie, it's very difficult because you don't, you don't really have a, enough... You've got to learn how to do it very quickly. In a, in a major movie, you have to be able to walk in and do it. But I think a lot of people do recall uh, you in Indiana Jones. I mean, uh, just as an anecdote, um, when we were getting ready for the, um, for the, the event this evening, a colleague had said to the um, member of their family, oh, David Gipps coming to talk tonight. And they immediately said, Indiana Jones. Right. Mm. They, um, so I think, uh, obviously, China Detective China is remembered well and fondly remembered, but also I think your role... By the senior members. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wanted to move on to some um, other part of your work, other aspects of your work, which is the theatre work as well. Mm. Because you've, you've mentioned that as... Um, as if you were um, had to choose between one medium, it would be theatre. And one one of the um, incredible pieces of theatre that I had the pleasure to see in Liverpool over the last decade was um, your Gold Mountain, mm. which was on Thank at the Unity. Um, it was a very experimental piece of theatre using a lot of digital projection. Multimedia. Uh, yeah, multimedia. And, um, and you wrote it with Kevin Wong. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a, a sort of interesting link here is that last year with the Confucius Institute, we put, put a movie on um, about the Chinese community in Liverpool, which was written by Kevin Wong. Mm -hmm. And then you wrote Gold Mountain with Kevin Wong. So that's a nice, nice link there. But could you um, explain to the audience what Gold Mountain was about, what it drew on, and some, some of the the technical experimentation that went on with the Montreal company that you, you did it with? Uh, 
and then we'll sh and then we'll show okay. the the uh, the trailer for it. Well, we've been talking about about uh, how careers go, and I was trying to explain it. It, it. it 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 isn't it isn't just it isn't a climb. How because, but one of the things I was very conscious of uh, as the years went by was and got frustrated by was a lot of non-Chinese people kept writing and telling me how who I was and what I felt and you know what I what I what I was doing. And I was looking for the I kept thinking, where are where are our where are our stories? Where's our own actual voice? And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you have to be Chinese or in any way to write you don't, because Ian Kennedy Martin wrote Ian Chinese Detective. But I was just thinking, where is our voice? And I'm just I'm just as much to blame as anybody else because basically Gold Mountain is very loosely based on my relation with my father. And I hastily add it's it's my version of my relationship with my father. The, my, my brothers and everyone else would tell you they've got, a, you know, maybe different. I, by no way am I saying it is truth, it's, but it's my, my relationship I had with him and then put through a dramatic phase. And it basically it's about a, a, a father and son and trying to understand this man who, at this point, you don't know whether he's actually, whatever he tells you, you don't know whether it's true or not, partly because that's the way he, he was, at certain times, and also because of illness and losing his mind or whatever as well. And it's, juxt it's juxtaposed with the 20th century history of China. And that's, big, that's a big plan for a little theatre. Mm -hmm. And when Un Unity Theatre asked me uh, over many years to do something for them, and um, 2008 <coughs> came, was coming up when Liverpool was the European capital of culture, and in 2007 they said, come on, come on, do something, do something with us. Um, and so I said, look, well, look, I've got this, I've got these things. I, I managed, 20 years before, so I, I'd, I'd recorded my father because I'd been asked, believe it or not, by Faber and Faber to write a book. And so I thought, okay, I'll, my dad, at that point, I didn't live in Liverpool, so I, whenever I went back and, and, and visited the house, <laughs> the only way my dad got up about four o'clock, four thirty in the morning, so I'd get up at six o'clock in the morning with him and have a cup of tea, and for like 10 minutes, he could talk about what was going on in the, in the late in the news? Anything? He'd say, oh, do, do so and so, so and so, so and so, and then like a switch would go off in his head, and he'd go into this story about his childhood. Now my dad's accent was really strong. I mean, he, his English wasn't great, and he, but he, whatever he, it was, it was quite difficult to understand. But I could sort of just about make by you. Most people would never, have, would never have understood him. But so I thought, well, I'll record him. So I started recording this story. And he, it, it, was, it started off about and how he, his family ran this, this farm and, and how one, this Kuomintang officer well, of another, in another family, he, he managed to insult him and, and his family had to get him out of the village and he ended up in Hong Kong. And from Hong Kong in, the in 1941, he got on a ship to Liverpool on a blue funnel ship and came to Liverpool and met my mum and there, there we were. And it was very difficult to follow. So I slowly, I, 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 I thought I'll take... I wrote it down and I tried to sort of picture this thing. Now, I, over the years, I'd, I'd had friends, sadly, who died from Alzheimer's. Not Alzheimer's, um, uh, do I mean Alzheimer's? What is it when you lose your... Uh, you could be dementia. Yeah. Dementia, dementia. dementia, yeah. And, and, but I always, I, I've never realised that early memory is, is very strong. You may lose things, but early memory. And I just kept thinking, you know, this early story, is, there's got to be so much more truth than, than fiction. In, in it, you know, and because uh, whenever and when, it, when he talked about his stories in the old days, in, the, in when he got older, oh, and I went to this and I won that, and I told them, oh, you you do this, and I I would tell them this, and I would tell them that. And he was always the star, you know. I would do that with that, and you think, mm, there's, a, there's a lot of souls. <laughs> but it's young, it, and that's what I, I used. It's the early stories, yeah. early memories. Well, could you say something about the Montreal Company? Oh yeah, well, as, say, the, as I say, the Unity Theatre who had very little money said to me. Will you do this? And, I, and we, we, we got an outline, and we tried to work it, and, it, I, and Kevin and I bounced it around. But it was based on, on, on Dad's, on the, the, the words I'd got from Dad. And it, it basically, as a theatre, it was never going to work. How did you bring, how did you bring the 20th century history of China onto? And he said it could be either a one-man play or a two-man, a two-person play. And I told him to forget it. I said, look, I'm, I, I tried, it's not going to work, and, I'm, and I've got to go and do other things. Now, luckily, Graham Phillips, who ran the Unity at that time, was invited to uh, Canada to a theatre conference, that sort of thing. And they met all these other practitioners. And, and he happened to meet uh, 
the people who from a wonderful theatre company called uh, forgive, forgive, forgive my French Le Demon, the, the, the new the two worlds, and they are in Montreal. They're they're a world famous uh, multimedia theatre company, productions going all over the world, and, you know, and they they said you know asked what they were doing. They got interested in it. Cut a long story short, Kevin and I went out there mm -hmm. to meet them. Uh, and they said, mm, okay, leave it with us and we'll have a look. And I thought, okay, that's not going to work. But in 24 hours, they, they said, look, um, they took a, a very rough script and they said, we went back the next day and they, on top of a, a laptop, they'd built a little set. And they, and they just said, well, just these are some ideas we're throwing around. And they, and they just did this thing. And suddenly, I realised the possibility of what could happen on the stage. Because it's, it's two actors, but there's two screens, mm -hmm. but these outside, out, out front was a guy on computers doing f film images, photographs. There was, uh, uh, Michelle was doing sound and also live music and things, uh, and, and then the lighting. And I had to learn very quickly, it's interesting because as an actor on stage, I'm used to telling you, the audience, a story. And I had to learn that I've got to share the stage with a screen and, and an image or a sound or a thing. Now, I, I was playing my father, I was playing the father figure and the young actor called Eugene Seller was playing me, a young, a young me. And he talked to it like Dr. Water. And I could get the hang of this, I kept saying it. You know, because uh, again, when you're rehearsing it, you, we had to film everything because there's things going on around you and mm -hmm. behind you. And I can remember when it came, we, we were at the Unity, we, were open, we opened in 2010 at the Unity, and about five days before we opened, uh, we, did, we, did, we were putting this together, and the director, who's a sweetheart, Daniel uh, Miller, uh, we used to have these note sessions, because we had, we had to film everything, cause, so the actors could see. And we had a three and a half hour, hour note session. He said five words to Eugene, like, well done. And the, the other three hours telling me, to, saying, no, no, <laughs> no. And, and he's right, because basically, he, he kept, what he was saying to me is, I was trying to act my, act, I was trying to tell you all this, I, I, let me tell you a story. And, and, and you say, look, you ignore it, this is happening, this is happening. And I remember that night, it was one of the worst moments of my life, actually. I, I went home thinking, all right, okay, what? And I didn't sulk, because I, I, I was so emotionally involved in this piece. I thought, well, what, 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 can I, what can I do? How can I really understand this? Because what he was saying is, all the things I trained to do, all the things that, he just he kept saying, no, take it away, take it away. And it's like, it's like take your clothes mm -hmm. off, you know what I mean? I think, well, what have I got? What have I got to play with? Uh, and basically, I, all I had was me. But I had to then share it with this thing. So I went in the next day, and I promise you, and it wasn't a sign. I just thought, okay, well, I'll try it. I won't do anything. I won't do anything. And that, that's what I did. I, we did this run, and I just did it. <laughs> At the end, they go, yeah, yeah, now <laughs> we can start, yeah. And it's true. And actually, my acting has never been the same since because it taught me, it taught me. No, because, again, I was trained in theatre. And theatre, when I was trained in it, was different than it is now. And we have a different technology now and, and everything else. You know, it's not, you don't have to be as big. Now, of course, if you're playing a huge theatre and you're playing a huge part, you can be. But it, it's interesting, when you play, and you'll see a little clip of it. And I've got to tell you, it's two actors, but the... This, the screens and the images are, are performers, so is the music and the sound, so the guys out front. And as I say, there's one point, various points in the, in the piece when Michel's soundscapes, and they really are soundscapes, but at, at certain points he did, he had, he had this, he did live things, and it was amazing because you never quite knew it, was, it would change. Well, I think... It, well, you saw it. Yeah, I mean, I think the description is that it's immersive theatre mm, yeah. because uh, you are... Uh, immersed as much in the performances by the the two two actors, but you're immersed in the archival films which are presented on screens, and there are a number of screens that move across the theatre. But uh, the the clip we've got is the trailer that uh, was produced to promote the piece itself. Mm. So um, let's have a look at that, and that'll give you a sense of. <coughs> what what uh, what Gold Mountain was all about, which toured the world, went to lots of places, and uh, won awards, particularly in the UK, I think. Uh, in Liverpool. Yes, Liverpool. <laughs> 
Tianshan Gold Mountain. Images of a six-year-old boy herding a couple of ducks along a dusty track in southern China. My dad. He could walk, my dad. He was the best walker ever. Blazing sun, freezing snow, thunder and lightning. He'd walk in anything, through anything. He wanted to change the world, my dad. I fell in love when I was 14. Have you ever fallen in love? I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. I couldn't do anything but think about her. Way, way. I would go to bed at night lying between my five brothers and three sisters. Hiya! One roll over, we all roll over. <laughs> Your mother, she pretty, Dabby, pretty. I like her smile. She could cheer up rain with her smile. You remember? You would have walked further. But there was the harbour and the sea opening out to the horizon and beyond. And on the other side of it is Gold Mountain. Well, this is it, Dad. You wouldn't recognize your village or the motorway running around it. The village cemetery has survived. So at least you can be with the rest of your family again. Who knows? Wei Wei might be here too. That's obviously a compendium of clips from the full piece, which you can view online on, on YouTube. You can see the whole show. No, uh, no you have to go to, oh, if you want to see, see the whole show, you, can, you have to go to my website, oh. www.davidyip.go, uh, and you can see it there. But it's, it, it is a theatre piece. It was only filmed not for, it was filmed for other producers to watch. So it, but, but you still get the feeling. Now, um, we were talking about David's contribution to a number of films just before. Um, and we, we've got clips, but we probably won't have time to play them now because the conversation's been so 
so, so uh, riveting about lots of different issues. So I will just say that um, David was in the series 24, uh, Live Another Day, that's the Kiefer Sutherland series, and also is in Fortitude with Michael Gambon, which is a Sky Atlantic series, which I think is probably airing now no, or it's, uh, earlier. Go back to start the uh, and you're still, because you've been filming all week mm. as well, so you're still very busy. And uh, David, uh, towards the end, will probably touch on what he's been doing of late. I just wanted to uh, throw it open now to the floor yeah, for... Always. Um, Q and a bit of Q and A with David. So, if you've got a question you'd like to ask him, there are some roving mics, um, and we'll see how it goes. But we 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 need to finish in here about quarter to eight, uh, so you can enjoy the reception that we've got outside with some dim sum, courtesy of the Confucius oh. Institute. So, if you no, let me know right. if you want to ask a question, I'll get the mic to you. And there's one at the top there. And just raise your hand if anyone's got another one. This is going to be horrendously monotone because I'm not the best uh, public speaker, so I've written it down. <laughs> um, what would you say was the major differences in the psychological preparations for the character of Felden in Doctor Who, seeing as I'm a big fan, <laughs> as opposed to like a thespian role? Uh, was there more pressure taken on such a universally loved piece? Um, that's something that was more romanticised than neoclassical and modern? Uh, oh, that was that. But I made that. that nice. <laughs> well, uh, OK. Uh, I think it's, it, it was one of the first televisions I ever did with Tom, Tom Baker in a pit in Devon. Um, uh, to be quite honest with you, and I, it is not, I'm not being tried, but quite honestly, uh, at that time, you basically you turned up and you did it. There was not a lot of preparation. There was not a lot of depth. Uh, but you still tried your best. But basically, at least, and at least I, you could see who I was. I wasn't. I didn't have a mask on or anything like that, or a monster. Uh, and do you know something? I still get royalties for that. Uh, but, <laughs> but actually, I think you're, you're touching the point. Is how how does that differ from preparing a a, a theatre piece where you have more time and go into the psychology of the character? I mean, the one thing about filming is, uh, well, the one of the good things, one of the great things about filming is that actually you can get thoughts over. You can get, if, if it's a very good close-up, you can really use your eyes, you, you, your thoughts. But obviously on a stage, you, you prepare, or I do personally, you, you, you go very deep into a character. And you, you obviously have to, if it's a, you have to make up certain things. And you're hoping that, that, that the relationship comes over to the audience, and obviously depending on, on the script. Um, and it's a, it's a slightly broader brush depending on what kind of theatre you're working in, because obviously it depends how far they are, are away. But, uh, but, there's not a, but, but really, the essence is the same. It's about truth in the end. And I, I would say, I, I, when I talk to young people doing drama, whatever you're playing in, it's always to find and be truthful. You know, so does that, does that make sense to you? Yeah, I was just saying, I was wondering whether... whether Sorry, could you use the mic? Sorry. I was wondering if it was more of a, more of a pressure with it being so universally loved as a Shakespearean play, whether you felt it was more like a more hardship in preparing. No, I, d I don't think it matters whether you know you're playing Hamlet or you're in the Doctor Who or whatever. In essence, as an actor, you go for truth. Now, obviously, you have more you have more scope if you're playing Hamlet because you're on stage longer. Uh, uh, but it's but even if you're even if you just part like like in you know in Indiana Jones, I, I'm not on the screen that long. In fact, the film starts after I'm dead. But it's <laughs> trying to find it's just trying to find the truth of whatever you're doing. Okay. Yeah, there's just in the middle there. Yep. Hi, David. This is kind Hi. of like a, a follow-up question. I've I've seen in the media recently. There's a big discussion about how actors work with the script now and I think it was Bill Nye was saying that a lot of young actors now don't actually like to prepare too much with the script they like to read it on the morning so that they feel that and you were saying about truth and authenticity yeah, so I'm, I don't want to put you on the spot but I'm kind of interested in what your take is is it do, do you start with the script and work out from there and, and this idea of just turning up with the script and the answer will come to you when you read it in the morning before the oh, scene yeah. 
It is. Yeah, uh, well, it's interesting because yeah, there's there's a. I think it's a generational thing, quite honestly. I mean, I because I've worked with actors, young actors, and, and they can they, they can they're good actors. But I promise you, uh, and you try, and as far as I'm concerned, and again, I think it's down to being a theatre trained more, you know, I want to do, I want to do the scene, I want to try and run the lines, because mm -hmm. the thing about lines in a film, and this, or particularly in a film, because in, in, in a play you'd rehearse anyway, but in a film, you know, depending who you're playing and who you are, you don't want to, you don't want to be stopping the filming too much, you're going to be able to get it right. But, but uh, I've had experiences in the last four or five years where, you say to a, a young actor, should we run the lines? Oh, oh no, 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 I don't, don't want to run the I, I don't want to run the lines. And then, oh, because, you know, I want, I, want to, I, want to, I want it to happen. I want it to be spontaneous. Well, yeah, well, you can be spontaneous. But it's, uh, acting. it's acting. It's acting, it's <laughs> acting. And also then, then so, so we start, and the, the, the actor starts speaking, and you're going, sorry? I, you can't hear him. You can't hear him. They're, they're, being, they're being naturalistic. You know, uh, well, you know, uh, no, no, it's <laughs> and it's and it, listen. I'm not there to say to you, sorry about that. You're doing the wrong. But it's it's, it's interesting. That there is a there is a, a school of thought which does that. I'm hopefully I'm not in that camp. Uh, I still feel like I said to the young lady over there. I think it's it, it, you go for a truth, but equally we are acting. You know, when I'm when I'm at, when when you're out there, you 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 are acting, and you guys pay money whether it's in this theatre or the thing, you're, you want to you be able to hear what's going on. The number of times recently, I'm, I'm watching television, and I've actually got surround sound, and I go, sorry, what did he say? And so I get the, I get the thing, and I go, I whiz it back. And I go, and actually, it's, it's really interesting. And I've, I, I've spoken to sound people about it. I said, it's not bad sound people, is it? I mean, it isn't. You said, no, it's, it's actors going, mm -hmm. <laughs> and what do you do? They I, call it mumble core. But you know, do you know also mm -hmm. what the answer is? And, and, in, especially in, in television and film, there are a lot of directors there who don't know how to direct actors, who are scared of actors, They're because they've come from a technical background, editing or whatever. And I'm, I'm working with one now. And he's a lovely guy, but he basically, you're an actor. Uh, when I say go, do it. Do, do, just do it. Like, turn the light on or turn the camera on. I want you to do it. I, I'll, I've never had a note from him yet. I've never had a note and ink from So he's not really directing you then, is he? No, he directs the scene. He directs the yeah, scene, yeah. scene, but basically, you know, and, and that's interesting. Whereas I love, I love being directed. I love being directed. I love, I love throwing something out and someone goes, it, it, yeah, well, try it this way. Yeah. That was good, but try, you know, do, do you know what I mean? In the, in the time that you're allowed. So, yeah, there's, there's a school out there which is, it's not my school. <laughs> yeah, there's this there. Um, hi, David. Hi. Um, I've just started um, doing more acting this year. So um, I have to say it's really difficult. It's not, it's not easy. Well, so, do you <laughs> so do you have any advice for people who want to break into career in acting? Ooh, um, well, start enjoying it. That's the most important thing. Because you don't get paid that well most of the time. Yeah, no, if, if, if you really want to act, then... As I said to you before, I went to drama school and I came out with a bag and it had tools in it, a toolkit. Uh, and that's what you, and actually, having said that, the thing that you have as an actor, I don't care whether they put you in a great costume or you're in a, a spaceship going zing, zing, zing. In the end, you only have yourself, all you have is your body. And actually, all you have is your voice. I mean, you may look great, but it's a, it essence, the actor is, this is it. This is it. Anything else they give you is extra. And it's about using that. And it's about really wanting it. I have too many young people come up to me and say, I, I want to be a star. Well, I say, well, fine, well, be a star, <laughs> but, but I'm not interested in, do you, do you want to act? Do you want to, you know, do you want to, what, what do you want to do? Why do you want to be a star? What kind of star do you want to be? I mean, a star is what? It's a well-known person. An actor a really is being a really good actor. So it's being truthful. It's being truthful. It's mm -hmm. understanding what you're doing, being able to use your voice because... Again, I go back to this thing, and because I, I, I am an old fart, really, but it's the, I was theatre trained. I can do eight shows a week, and it gets tiring, depending on how big your part and what you do. I can do eight shows a week, and it, uh, but I know by Friday, my voice is getting tired, and I know how, I know how to deal with that. You're doing the matinee, you know. But I've been with, I've been with that young actors who've hardly done any theatre, and, and by Wednesday, they're, they're swallowing the throat sweets, they're, they're going, ugh. 
but they're still going out and, and maybe partying <laughs> or doing something else in the meantime. And, and it's about, and don't get me wrong, I'm no saint, but if, if this is all you've got, this is your instrument, then you've got to, you've got, you have got to look after it. And I know you, when you're very young, you can get away with certain things, but as you get older, it, 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 it is a technical thing. So it's learning the techniques. So the more, and, and, and technique isn't a dirty word, as a, as a what we were going again. This idea that it is totally instinctive is, is rubbish. I mean, and on a film, they can get someone and get them to do it once, or, you know, just do something. And I'm the wood. But actually, it isn't. Acting isn't being instinctive and natural. It, there's got to be a lot of technique under that. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's like being a, a decorator or something. A decorator just doesn't come out and go, I think I'll splash some paint there. They've got, they, there's an underlying knowledge of what should happen, you know, bef before you, as you do things. Uh, and that's why I can't paint, you know. So <laughs> does, does that answer your question? Okay. We've got time for one more before we have to close up. And yes, oh. yeah, right in the middle there. Oh, right. lady here too. Lady here too. Do put your hand up again so we can see. Yep. Hiya. Um, so my question is more about how your acting has helped you uh, with your filmmaking. So through your years of Sorry, I missed that. that. Have I? I acting well? um, so with your years of experience of acting, mm. um, I'm not entirely sure when you started doing your own kind of directing or filmmaking or anything, or, uh, or your own productions on theatre, but how has your acting experience helped you with your own productions? Has, okay. it, imp has it improved your directing, your communication with your actors? No, I'm principally an actor. I, I, Go Gold Mountain, I wrote, and I'm in it. And I've directed a short film, and I don't think no, I, I, I'm, 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 I am an actor, but uh, but the experience of being an actor over the years I've done it has given me a a certain uh, understanding from my point of of, of what of, of what's, what's required, uh, and also perhaps a, a bit more courage to have a go. But uh, I loved I loved Go Mountain. Because uh, I, 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 when we were in Montreal, we were rehearsing, and, I had, and we kept changing the script, so I had to, I had to rehearse and, and then take notes and at night write, and then come back and rehearse the next day so they could give them the script. And that was really, it was really amazing, because yeah. uh, obviously I've never done anything like that before in that way. Uh, but that's not, that, that was an exception. Now, if I had to do it again, maybe I'd be more prepared. But I, I don't regard myself really as a writer, or, or and I haven't done that much direction. I'd love to direct some theatre. I couldn't direct film, I don't think. But, but instinctively, it's just, it's just experience. And I'm lucky. I've had lots of fantastic experience. Uh, I've always had to fight against the, uh, the stereotyping, and that's why uh, I like doing small projects, if they're good. Things that the, the filming I'm doing now helps to pay for the small bits of mm -hmm. artwork I do, I like doing. And, I, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm lucky because I do that, and I enjoy it. So it, 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 it it's a build-up of, of confidence and, and understanding and knowledge, I suppose. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, so you. let's get, there was... A, a lady here, I think. And the, the the, who was it? Just... Uh, and there's a lady here. Oh, okay, uh, okay. The okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, we have to there. go. Um, hi, David. I would really like to thank you, because um, I'd like to reiterate that you were a role model for not just the East Asian community in the UK, well, but the South right. Asian as well. And alongside, I know they precede you, but you know, um, Cyril Regis and Labby Sifri and all those people who were there as, as yeah. role models. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you what you think about this, the Hollywood casting of non East Asians that's coming up again. They're like sidestepping the issue. Yeah. And I know it's a balance between stereotyping, but if there are good film roles out there, why aren't the good? East Asian actors that are around now. Well, do, do, do you know what my answer? It's a very clear answer. It, it, if it was the Afro Caribbean part, or if it was the South Asian part, they wouldn't get away with it. Mm -hmm. At the moment, they 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 thought, and they and for a lot and for for a long time in this country, they knew they could walk all over us because mm -hmm. we didn't make any noise. Yeah. Our, as a community, we didn't make a noise, and now we we we, we st we've started to. And that's why they can get away. That's why they were able to get away with it. Now th it's slowly swinging back. And it, it, it's a whole other thing about, the, what it's, it's about the voice thing again. And it's about the stories again. It's about the community stop 
being shy and stop, not wanting to make a fuss and standing up. I, I, I don't mean to be trite about this, but I've said it so many times. The trouble with the Chinese in this country is they never had a good riot. You know, <laughs> whereas the other, but you wouldn't mess with the Afro Caribbeans and you wouldn't mess with the South, South Asians. And that's, that's my answer to you. Just, just, just did, lady, did you put your hand up or not? Oh, you. Just strike before you do, though. Yes, okay. We'll okay. have to make this the last right, yeah. question as well. So. Just uh, following on from uh, the having non Eurasians playing Eurasians, are you finding that it's easier to play colorblind roles, that you are just a representative of an individual rather than always having to be the Chinese person? Um, I play, I've played very few colorblind roles, apart from on the stage, I've done Shakespeare and things like that. Uh, but I'm very careful, uh, in the, say in the, over the last 25 years, that I'm happy to play a Chinese guy who's got a Chinese accent, if he's real, if, he's, if, if it's a real story, you know? Uh, and it's a real person, and, and the, the, the drama is, there's some truth in it. I don't want to play the stereotypical triad boss, drug dealer, pimp, uh, takeaway guy, you know, uh, because it's like when I, I created a character in Brookside who's going to be a doctor, and what my dad was about a Chinese wrestler. And I insisted, I said to him, this guy is going to be middle class. They said, why is he going to be middle class? Because I said, otherwise, because he can't, he, can't, then he, can't, he can't put over ideas. Dad's got the accent. Mm -hmm. My little girl has a Liverpool accent. This guy is going to be able to articulate, because that's the problem, you know. And some people are great about making the inarticulate articulate. That's a that's a that's a writing gem, but too often, you know, they use they use the idea of giving him a strong accent or anything, and it becomes a joke. So I hope I've tried to avoid. I'm happy to play East Asian parts, but they've got to be people. They've got to be real. It's got to be real, you know, and they've got to have a story to them. Uh, but. I don't want to. I don't want to slander or stereotype my community, and I hope I haven't in the last twenty odd years. We have to uh, come to a close in this room now, and um, please join us outside yeah. for reception. And I'm sure David will take any yeah. informal questions there. But ov obviously, uh, I'd like to thank David for coming this evening and to talk through fascinating aspects of his career in both film, TV and theatre. Uh, it's such a bonus for students as well and the local community here to have uh, somebody with the background he's got to be able to talk so uh, eloquently and commonsensically as well about working in film and TV. It's, it really helps our students be able to, to hear someone talk in that way. Uh, before I ask you to show your appreciation, um, the university's got a, a little gift for David. We'd like to All pass right. on to you here. It's not a check. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I would just like to say it's, it's, been, it's been, really, been really nice coming to talk about myself. That's, that's great. But actually, you know, I would love to come back and talk about the politics of not, not, not my, what, what I've been doing, but the politics of, of representation, mm -hmm. visual mm -hmm. representation, and, and, and that's some of the type of things we've touched yep. on uh, and how that's changing one day. Fine, we'll book experience. you in whenever yeah, you can yeah. do that. Well, thank we'll you all. We'll definitely get you, you in. Well, I'll thank see you, you in the bar. Thank you. Yeah.